So um, I do have a few people that have completed the ISLO assignment. Um, I just needed to make sure that you guys are aware of the ISLO assignment is not optional, okay? So it's not something that you can choose to not do. I have to have it done. Um, and my department's already sending me emails saying, you know, not all your students have completed the ISLO. Please make sure that they complete it. As an incentive for you guys taking the time to complete it, I did offer extra credit for your completion of that assignment, okay? So I just wanted to make you guys aware that you do need to complete it. Um, I'm just giving people bonus points toward a test because you're taking the time to complete it, okay? Um, but it is not an optional assignment. It is something that everyone taking this class should be completing, okay? So make sure you do click on that assignment and you read through those instructions um, and then complete the, the Google form that's embedded at the bottom, okay? I think I've only had about four people in the class complete that, okay? So I need, I guess, the other seven or so to, to get in there and get it done, okay? Um, and it's not too, too long. I'm probably spend more time reading it than you are gonna be doing your computations and typing in your sentences, but um, it does need to be done, okay? And then this other one, this one is not required. This one is completely optional. However, if you don't have a 75 or higher in your total grade in Canvas as of right now, I would definitely strongly suggest that you complete the uh, quiz so that way you can get as many bonus points as you can towards your test score. Your test scores are like a good chunk of your um, grade in the class. So definitely wanna get as many points in that pool as possible, okay? Um, now for today, we're actually going to start talking about uh, 4.1. Now we'll, we'll start 4.1 and if we finish it, great. If we don't, that's okay. I'm just gonna keep moving along as we go. Um, but I would hope that we could get 4.1 and maybe at least start 4.2, so it's the goal. But whatever happens, happens, okay? It just depends on how long it takes me to explain certain things, okay? Um, so let me go ahead and do you guys see my screen? Those of you that are on camera, if you see my screen, can you give me a thumbs up real quick? Um, okay, cool, cool. Um, that way I know <laughs> you'll be able to see everything that I'm gonna do here on paper. So what is going on with my visualizer? There it goes. Let's make sure we focus and freeze that focus so it doesn't keep going in and out. Now, before I start this, I do wanna kind of quickly go over like the game plan for the next couple of weeks. So right now we're in week 11 and we will start 4.1. Maybe we'll finish it. Maybe we won't. It, it just depends. I'll shift these things around. Okay. Um, but next week, the goal is to cover 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. Um, one of these sections is really short. I think it's 4.4. That's the really, really short section. It literally takes like 15 minutes to explain that section. So I have some confidence that we'll be able to cover all three within our two, our two days. Okay. Um, so I don't know that I'll have to bleed 4.4 into the next day, but I just put it there just in case. <laughs> um, 4.5 is the biggest one just because that section has a lot of equations and a lot of word problems to solve. Okay, so I know for sure I will need a whole day to talk about that one. Um, and then of course, whatever time we have left on that Thursday, we'll start ask, answering questions about the review. And then I'll post the solutions to everything later, just like I did for this one, okay? Um, and just like all the other ones, the test three is um, open notes as well, okay? So the final exam is open notes as well, but I would highly recommend that for the final exam, you actually create a note sheet, something that's uh, readily accessible, not so that you're wasting time like shuffling through papers, okay? Um, so definitely, definitely make a, a, a note sheet for the final exam. But I'm hoping we can use the work on the review for the final, both of the days of that last week. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start the discussion about 4.1. Now, chapter four, together is about inverses 
and then something that's called an exponential function, and then something that's called a logarithmic function. Okay, and you probably have heard those words before exponential logarithmic, but here we're actually going to like find out what they are. Okay, and it turns out that exponentials and logarithms are inverses of each other. Okay, and that's kind of the reason why they start this chapter with talking about inverses. Because once you learn something about one, you can kind of translate that over into information about the other one, okay? Now, although cryptography is like very, very, very fun in my opinion, <laughs> we are not going to be addressing cryptography in this class. If you're one of those people that wants to like decode what the spies are saying that cryptography is, is, is it, okay? Um, but, <laughs> and I really, really love it. That's like my, one of my favorite concepts in math, but we're not going to be able to talk about that in this class, okay? Um, so the first thing we're going to address is what are called one-to-one -one functions. So we know that when we applied in the past that vertical line test, um, so if you had a function, right, and let's say you had a graph and it looked like this, and if you applied a bunch of vertical lines to it, right, if all your vertical lines only touched the graph one time, then it was called a function, right? Whereas if you had a graph like this, and if you drew just one vertical line right there, it actually touched the graph twice, right? And so then that one was not considered a function. So the vertical line test told us whether or not it was a function. Now, in this section, we will always be talking about functions. So all of the graphs, all of the functions that they give us will pass this vertical line test, okay? But there's going to be a new test that we learn to. Um, and in that new test, we're going to actually apply what's called a horizontal line test. So instead of me applying my vertical lines, I will eventually apply horizontal lines to find out if something is one-to-one. -one. So for example, this parabola that I drew is not one-to-one -one because as soon as I draw a horizontal line like that, don't I touch it two times, right? So that guy would not be one-to-one. -one. And a one-to-one -one function is essentially where one Y value is assigned to one X value. So if you plug in a number for X, you should only get one number back out, okay? Similarly, the other way around. If I plug in one number for Y, then I should only get one number back out. So the classic example that they usually give us is like, what if I had a function like this? There's a problem with that. Y squared and any um, quadratic actually um, is not one-to-one. -one. They're not, no quadratic at all is ever one-to-one, -one, okay? And the reason is, is because when you use the quadratic formula to solve, or if you just solve this using the square root property, you always end up with two answers, right? If I tried to plug in a number for y, let's say I plugged in the number four. And then let's say I tried to solve for this x value and I took the square root on both sides. Well, according to the square root property, you get plus or minus, right? which means you plugged in one Y value, but you got two X's that get mapped to that one Y value. So that's why Y squared or X squared is not one-to-one, -one, okay? And any parabola, any X squared or quadratic function is not gonna be one-to-one. -one. Think about the quadratic formula, right? It's like negative B and then right there in the middle is plus or minus. So right there, you already have two answers, right? So that's why none of your quadratics will be one-to-one, -one, okay? And the big idea with inverses is that you cannot have an inverse unless you're one-to-one. -one. So quadratic functions do not have inverses, okay, at all. So you notice that when they give us our functions, they're never just a regular plain quadratic, okay? Now here, this little rule, this is the rule that they give you, but this is not the version of the rule that you actually use. You actually use this version of the rule. So for a function to be one-to-one, -one, 
if a and b are x values of the functions, it says if the, this x value doesn't equal that x value, then the corresponding y values should not be equal either, okay? Um, the other way of saying that, and this has to do with logic, I'm not expecting you to understand, you know, how to paraphrase things logically, because that's like a whole class. <laughs> but another way of writing this is to say that if you have the same y values, then you had better have the same x values, okay? In order for it to be one-to-one, -one, if you've got the same y's, it should only happen with one single x value, okay? So those x values must be the same. Um, so it says that different values of the function correspond to different values, or no, it's here it is, different values of the domain. correspond to different values of the range. So different X's should mean different Y's, right? And if you're telling me they're the same, then the X's should be the same too. So we don't really do these problems using this statement, but we will use do these problems using this statement over here, okay? So we're gonna start off with the first one. Now, if I were to want to write f of a, it basically means I'm plugging in a into my function. So f of a equal to f of b would mean negative 4a plus 12 equals, and then you plug in b, negative 4b plus 12. And you essentially do the math to get one of those letters by itself. And that letter should equal the other letter, okay? If it doesn't, if it has all this other weird stuff going on with it, then it's not one-to-one, -one, okay? So for this problem, if I were to try to solve, for instance, A, I would have to go minus 12 on both sides. And then I would have negative 4A equal to negative 4B. Again, to finish solving for A, um, I would have to divide by negative four on both sides. That would cancel out the negative four and it actually cancels out the negative four over on the other side as well. And so I do get that A equals B. So if they have the same Y value, that means they should have the same X value if it were one-to-one, -one. okay? So all of this work tells me or implies, that's what that means, um, that F is one to one. If I had got A equal to B plus two, or A equal to B squared, or A equal to negative B, A equal to something other than just B, that's when you say that it's not one to one. So let's go try the other um, problem. So we'll plug in A and then we'll plug in B. So we're trying to start with this. So F of A looks exactly like this, but A instead of X. And F of B will look exactly like that, but with B instead of X. I said it and I didn't write it. <laughs> so if I'm gonna try to solve for instance A, I need to get rid of the house first. So in order to get rid of the house, I would have to square both sides of my equation but that actually makes the house go away on the other side as well. Then again, to keep trying to solve for A, I would have to minus 25. And then the next thing I would have to do is get rid of the coefficient. And since there's a negative in front, 
my coefficient is negative one. So I would have to divide both sides by negative one. That would give me positive a squared equal to positive b squared. But in order for me to solve for a, I would have to take the square root on both sides. But according to the square root property, when you do that, the square root on the left-hand side does take the house off, but on the right-hand side, you should automatically get plus or minus. And so even though the house and the square undo each other the same on the right-hand side, you have plus or minus, right? And that means that it's not one-to-one -one, because I didn't get just A plus B or A equal to B, but I also got that A equals negative B. So you got two different A values, okay? And when that happens, when in your A equals something other than just B, it's automatically going to tell you that the function is not one-to-one. -one. So there's a couple of problems in the homework assignment that ask you to do that. So they'll give you a function, they'll ask you to decide whether or not it's one-to-one. -one. And that's essentially what you do. You plug in A, you plug in B, you do the math to try to solve for A. And if you get B, it is one-to-one. -one. If you get anything else other than just B, then it's not one-to-one. -one. Now I mentioned this horizontal line test, right? So if the function is one-to-one, -one, it would pass the horizontal test. So functions already have to pass the vertical line test. Now, in order for me to know if that function has an inverse, it has to pass the horizontal line test, okay? So for me to tell you whether or not a function has an inverse, it has to pass both of those tests, horizontal and vertical. I did those backwards. This is vertical and this way is horizontal. So looking at this next um, page, it says, they give me the graphs, and it says, determine whether each of these graphs is the graph of a one-to-one -one function, okay? And so you'll notice that over here, it didn't matter how many times they drew the vertical lines, right? Every single one of these vertical lines touches the graph exactly one time. So this graph is one-to-one. -one. However, this little parabola, not parabola, um, polynomial, right? This polynomial is not one-to-one -one, because all they had to do was draw one line right there and notice that it touched the graph one, two, three times, right? I could have drawn a line down here, I could have drawn a line down here, wherever. But if there's just one of these horizontal lines that touches the graph more than once, it's automatically not one-to-one. -one. So this guy is not one-to-one. -one. So in general, since you can't have the same y value, it makes sense that your graph is not going to be increasing and decreasing on the same image. Because if that's the case, if this is my y value and I'm increasing and then I'm decreasing, don't you touch that same y value twice, once as you're going up and then once as you're going down, right? Um, so in general, a function that is completely increasing on its entire domain, or if the function is completely decreasing on its entire domain. Those are the only kinds of functions that are gonna have in, uh, inverses, okay? Those are the only ones that will be one-to-one. -one. And they give us these examples like X, right? The graph of X is just the line, but it's constantly going up or it's constantly going down. The cube, that's the one that looks kind of like a chair. 
it's either going up or if it flipped over, then it's going down, right? Um, but it's constantly doing the same thing. And one over X is a little bit weird to look at, but it is very similar. Um, if you notice, this one is decreasing. And then as I start over here, it's also decreasing. Okay, so it is decreasing everywhere. So there's a few ways to decide whether or not um, a function is one-to-one -one or not. You could do like we did in our examples, right? Where if we're given the actual functions, then you would plug in A, plug in B, do your math, and see if you get A equal to B, okay? Um, this one's more if they give you your functions as a list of numbers, okay? Because if they give you a list of numbers, you just wanna make sure that there's no X value that has more than one Y value. Okay, if you have two X values that have the same Y value, those had better have the same X's, right? They have to be one-to-one. -one. And then the other one is if you're given a picture, then you could apply the horizontal line test, okay? Or if somehow you just coincidentally know whether a function is always increasing or always decreasing, then that's another way to tell that it's one-to-one. -one. This one though, people probably are not gonna be able to know Okay, um, so you're usually, if you're given a function, you'll use this. If you're given a table or a graph, you'll use this. And if you're given a graph, you'll use that one. Okay, it just depends on what you're given, how your function is given to you. So I think we have a couple um, of problems in the homework section that, that do that. They'll give you the graph and they'll give you the function and then ask you if it's one-to-one. -one. Now, this page is completely gone. So these are the composition functions. And it turns out that if you were to take a function and its inverse and try to plug one into the other, they undo each other and you just get X. And it wouldn't matter which one you plugged into which, both ways it would give you X, okay? But we don't have any problems in our homework or on the test or on the final that make us do this. So we're just not gonna talk about it too much other than what I've already said, okay? Um, but we do need to know how to find if it's one-to-one -one with a list of points or with a table, okay? So for all of these, they just want us to know if the function is one-to-one, -one, then we can find the inverse, okay? And there's something about inverses that they haven't quite said yet. And so I think I need to mention it before we get to this problem, okay? This point right here, it says, if you have a point AB on the graph of a function, then the swapped coordinates will be a point on the inverse, okay? That's a super important fact that we're gonna need to use to do this next example. So essentially what an inverse does is it reverses the order of the ordered pairs, okay? So for instance, on this particular function, if you notice, none of the X values are the same, right? Um, but I do have two points that have the same Y value, don't I? Okay, so this one is not one-to-one. -one. And you actually have two points. You have negative two that goes to one and then zero that goes to one. So that's already one problem in telling me that it's not one to one, but then you have the same thing happening over here with the Y value two, right? So this guy is not one to one, which means it has no inverse. So you cannot say what the inverse is because it doesn't have one. Then the next one though looks good, right? All the X's are different, all the Y's are different. Yeah, I know we see zero and zero, but they're not in the same spots, right? This zero is there for X and then that zero is there for Y. So I don't have any of the X's repeating and I don't have any of the Y's repeating. So for this example, it is one-to-one. -one which allows me to find the inverse, okay? Yes. 
Uh, so I was wondering, like, for the, oh, um, like, does it have to pass both the horizontal and the vertical, like, line test, or is it just horizontal for one-to-one -one functions? Well, in order for it to be a function, it has to pass the vertical line test, and then in order to be a one-to-one -one function, it has to pass both. Okay. 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 Good question. So for example, for B, we do know that this is one-to-one, -one, but it says if it is, then we need to find the inverse. So the inverse is not too bad when they give you a list. All you do is literally swap the coordinates on each point. So this first point will become one, three. And the second point will become two, zero. The third point will become three, two, and then the fourth point will become zero, four. Okay. So here we could do the inverse because it was one to one. Whereas in part A, it wasn't one to one. So we could not find an inverse. Inverse only exists for one to one functions. Now, part C is a little interesting. It says, um, let me make all this stuff here. There we go. It says the table shows the number of hurricanes recorded in North Atlantic during the years 2009 to 2013. And it says, let, let F be the function defined in the table with the years forming the domain and the numbers of hurricanes forming the range. So they don't say anything weird like, you know, your X value is going to be zero for 2009 and one for 2010, nothing weird like that. So essentially these are my X's and these are my Y's, okay? And if it's asking me to see if I can find an inverse, I need to first make sure that it's one-to-one, -one, right? So do any of these X values repeat? No. Do any of the Y values repeat? No. So this one is one-to-one, -one, which does allow me to take an inverse, okay? And when you're doing an inverse, you basically have X and then Y inverse. So it's a whole new table. And all you're doing is swapping. So instead of the column on the left, it's gonna be the same numbers, but on the right-hand side. Okay, so 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, and then 2013. And then instead of this column being on the right, it'll be on the left. So we'll have three, 12, seven, 10, and two. So it's nice when the you with the points or with the um, table because we're just swapping them right it's pretty much the same thing with the graph okay if they give you a graph you find the inverse the same way for this class we will not give you the function like f of x equals 5x minus something and then ask you to find the inverse Okay, they just don't do that in this version of the class. If you take 1414, they'll do it, but not for this class, okay? So the only time they're ever gonna ask you to find the inverse is if they give you points, or if they give you a table, or if they give you a picture, like a graph, okay? Those will be the only times you have to find an inverse. So we have to talk about these graphs. So it says the inverse of a one-to-one -one function is found by interchanging the X and Y values, which we've done, right, um, in its ordered pairs. The equation of the inverse is defined by Y equals F of X is found in the same way. So if you're given the graph, let's say I'm giving you this point here. Let's say this is the function, okay? This is the original function. 
and I ask you, well, what does the inverse function look like? Okay. All you have to do is write these guys ordered pairs and then swap them. Okay. So for that point, it would be zero for X, zero for Y. For this point, it'd be one for X and one for Y. And for that point, it would be two for X, but one, two, three for Y. Okay. And if I swap those, well, zero, zero stays zero, zero. When I swap one and one, it stays one and one. And when I swap two and three, it becomes three, two. So if I graph those points, zero, zero is still right there. One, one is still right there. But now I have three, two, which is over here. And if I connect those dots, this is F inverse of X, okay? Now, a cool thing that they're gonna mention in the next section is that these guys are actually reflections of one another. And they're reflections of each other over the line y equals x. So if I were to draw the line y equals to x, it would look like this pink line. This is y equal to x. And if you notice, it's like the y equals x is a mirror, right? One, one function is a mirror image of the other function. If you were to rotate it over that pink line, it would land on the other one. And that literally has to do with the fact that all you're doing is swapping the x and the y. Okay. So let me go to the next page. So like I mentioned, we are not ever gonna be given the function as an equation and then asked to find the inverse. So we're not gonna cover the steps that's required to do that. And we're not going to find the inverse if we were given an actual function, okay? We're only gonna be finding inverses if we're given a list of points like that, a table or a graph, okay? Those are the only times you'll be asked to find an inverse. So the next page is going to get skipped. I think it's page, it just says four, five. So this one says page four, four. That's the end of four, four. And we're gonna skip four, five. Now, four six gives us some more practice problems like this. Okay. So, if I look at the bottom of four six, we're going to skip example six. If I look at example seven, it's asking me for the same thing. Okay. It's asking me to, in each set of axes in the figure, the graph of a one to one function f is shown. So I don't need to apply any tests to know if it's one-to-one. -one. It's literally telling me they're one-to-one, -one, okay? But they want me to graph F inverse. So all we do is swap the coordinates of those points. So I see that on this line, I have this point. Well, if I swapped them, it would be zero, negative four, which is actually down here. And if I were to take these points and swap them, it would be one and three right here. And then if I draw that line instead, I'm trying, I tried as best as I could, but it's not straight. <laughs> Notice again that they're like mirror images of each other over that dotted line, okay? Same thing here, you've got the point zero, zero, that's gonna stay one, one. If I swap it, it's still one, one, right? But two, four will become four and two, which means my function will actually go in that direction. And again, it's a mirror image. Looks like a lot like the example I created, <laughs> but it's a mirror image of over that y equals x. Okay. So you're literally just swapping points. 
not too, too bad. Now there's another problem, example eight. We don't cover that one either. I don't know why I didn't cross it out, but we don't cover example eight either. However, we will talk about this kind of like important facts box because it does tell us some important information. So it tells us that if f is a one-to-one -one function, then its inverse exists, okay? So you do not have an inverse unless it's one-to-one. -one. And this one's really interesting too, because finding ranges can be a pain in the butt. You really have to know what the picture looks like in order for you to figure out what the range is, okay? That's not something that you can just look at the function and then know what the, invert, what the uh, range is gonna be. We can look at a function and figure out what the domain is gonna be, right? Um, but we can't look at a function and figure out what the range is going to be. So this is nice because if a function does have an inverse, then guess what? You just have to look at the domain of the inverse to figure out what the range of your function is. So that's nice. This relationship domain of F is going to be the same as the range, right? Because your X's become Y's. And the range of F is the same as the domain of the inverse because your Y's become X's when you do that swapping. This point we already mentioned, right? If you have a point on the function, then the swapped version will be on the inverse, okay? And the two graphs should be reflections over the line y equals x. And then the last statement is basically how you find the inverse if you were given a function, but we don't do this, okay? But this is just saying if you interchange the variables x and y, and you solve for y, that's how you would find the inverse, okay? So there is a technique to find this guy's inverse, but we don't do it, okay? And then if we did do that, then we would be able to figure out cryptography, but we're not doing cryptography. So they basically showed us the formula on how they mapped this out, okay? How a became one, two, all of that good stuff. Um, and then you basically find the inverse and then you can essentially decode the messaging, okay? So, but we're not doing that, <laughs> don't worry about it, but it is how they would work it out. Hard part is figuring that formula out. That's not given to you when you're doing real life cryptography. You have to develop that formula. So how are we on time? Wow. We finished 4.1. It's not too, too much in 4.1 though, right? In order for you to have an inverse, you have to be one-to-one. -one. And then in order to find the inverses, you're just swapping those coordinates, okay? So it's not too, too much from that section. We will talk about it again when we get to 4.3. Because remember I mentioned that exponentials and logarithms are inverses of each other, okay? So in 4.2, we're basically gonna introduce what an exponential is, show you some cool things about it, and then we're gonna introduce to you logarithms in 4.3, and then we're, we're gonna say, hey, notice that if you just swap the coordinates around, that was the same thing as the exponentials because they're inverses of each other, okay? So I'm gonna go as much as I can go. We got about 20 minutes left. We won't finish 4.2, there's a lot. <laughs> And I'm not trying to like super rush through anything because I want to make sure we get this stuff. So there are some exponent uh, properties that we'll talk about. We'll talk about exponential functions, right? What, what do they look like? And what do the graphs look like, right? Then we'll see some equations that have exponentials and we'll learn how to solve those equations. Exponentials are really, really used in real life in things called compound interest. So if you have a credit card or a car loan, things like that, they're using compound interest. Um, and so you learn stuff about compound interest, okay? And then we'll learn about the number E. You guys know about the number pi, right? It's like 3.14159 dot, 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 it goes forever. 
this is another number like pi. It, it is 2.781828, blah, 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 okay? But it's another one of those weird numbers that pop up a lot in nature. And so it's gonna come up in this section, okay? And for those, they're used to talk about what's called continuous compounding. So you never want a credit card with that. So compounded interest, normally the way credit cards work is on a monthly uh, situation. So like you have a credit card balance, right? And then at the end of the month, if you didn't pay any payments on that balance, they calculate the interest that you should be charged based on that balance. And then they add that interest charge to your balance, right? Well, then the next month, if you don't pay, right? If you don't pay the payment at all, then that total amount, the amount that you had used on your credit card and the interest is together combined and they collect interest on that total amount again at the end of the month. So it's not like they're just finding the interest on what you swiped your card for. They're finding the interest on top of the interest they already added to your balance, okay? So it's like even the money that you owe them for borrowing it is collecting more money for them every single month if you don't pay it off, okay? So that's how all this crazy credit card debt and stuff like that, student loan debt keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because the interest itself is earning interest, okay? Um, which is great if you're an investor, <laughs> right? <laughs> Your money's making money for you, that's fantastic. But if you're a person that's borrowing, it's not fantastic. <laughs> um, so it's definitely worth learning about. Out of this whole class, this is probably the most crucial thing that I would say that you would benefit from learning in real life, right, is gonna be about compound interest. Um, and I have used it. I My very, very first car, I got a Kia and I knew about compound interest. So when I showed up to the dealership to get my car, um, they gave me like what my loan was gonna be. Like they showed me, here's the value of the car that you're about to purchase. Here's the interest you're gonna pay. And here's the total amount that you're gonna be paying after the whole like four or five years, whatever it was at that time. Um, and it didn't make any sense. The number that they came up with for the interest was like extremely large. And I know about compound interest and continuously compounding. So I use this formula knowing that that's going to create more interest, right, to add to my balance. And even with using this formula, I did not come up with a number as high as the number that they had on paper. So I asked to talk to the finance department. I talked to the finance department. And I said, look, I understand compound interest. I even understand continuously compounded interest. And I'm doing the numbers and I don't get what you get. And sure enough, he goes back and he's like, wait a minute. And he looks in his computer and he dot, 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 dot. And he comes back and he, I literally saved $6,000 just by bringing it up. And I mentioned this story to everyone because... It's worth mentioning. I can't imagine how many people don't even know about compound interest, go to buy a car and they're getting overcharged $6,000 or even more, right? So it happens. It's very <laughs> good to know the math behind all that stuff that's happening so that you can prevent yourself from being in these, they are predatory situations, okay? People are taking advantage of the fact that people don't know math. Um, so be on alert when we get to that stuff, it's gonna be good stuff, okay? Um, so for exponent properties, some of the exponent rules that we've been doing before still apply, but we don't quite use them too, too much. So we're gonna kind of get into some, what they call additional properties of exponents. One thing we need to know is that an exponential is kind of like the reverse from an exponent. So normally you were doing problems that look like this, right? Well, now in this section, we're gonna be doing problems that look like this, okay? So our base is going to be a number and our exponent is going to be the variable. The other way around than what we're used to, right? We're used to having number exponents. Now we're having variable exponents. So it's a little weird and a little um, bit strange to get used to. The only condition that they have is that your base cannot be one because it wouldn't matter what X is, 
whether it was positive, negative, a fraction, a decimal, it don't matter. One raised to any power is just one. And this function right here is not um, an exponential function. It's a flat line. It's a horizontal line. Okay. So that's why they say your base cannot be one. And even more so, your base should be a positive number. Okay. So later on, you're going to see this, and I'll just mention it now. Later on, you're going to see something like this. And you have to remember that that does not mean that the base is negative, okay? What it means is that you have a negative times your exponential, okay? So your base is not negative. Your base is just the two. You just happen to have a negative in front of it. And remember what negatives do, right? Negatives flip the fraction, the graph over. So if you do have a negative in front, it's just basically going to flip your graph upside down. We'll get to it later, but I just kind of wanted to mention that, okay? Because they're talking about it right here, saying that your base has to be positive. So when you do take a number and you raise it to another number, you do get a real number back. It doesn't matter what you plugged in what you did, um, it's gonna give you a number back out. Give me one second, I have, there we go. Um, and it says that the y equals a of x is a function. And so normally we write it f of x equals a to the power x. And the domain is negative infinity to infinity. You can plug anything you want up here. Any number you want to plug up there, you can plug it in, okay? The range is a little bit different, and we'll talk about that when we get to the graph of it, okay? This is a super important property. We will be using it at the end of this section, which we probably won't get to until next week, but <laughs> we will be using this property, okay? It's called the one-to-one -one property. So I told you that logarithms and exponentials were inverses of each other, which should automatically tell you that they're one-to-one, -one, both of them, because they can't have an inverse unless they're one-to-one, -one, right? Um, so because of this one-to-one -one relationship, in order for this, this expression to equal that expression, aren't the bases already exactly the same? So in order for you to say that that number is equal to that number, it would mean that their exponents would have to be equal, okay? So if you have an exponential function like that and the bases are the same, the only way that this could be true is if the exponents were the same. And that is gonna be a super big one. That's gonna be used a lot in this section and a couple of more sections, okay? We're gonna be using that fact a lot. Now, I don't know too much about this. This not These two facts, we don't really use too much. There is something important about A being bigger than one or A being a fraction less than one. Um, and it has to do with the graphs. But as far as like the exponents and all of that jazz, that it's not too, too much important. Um, but they're just saying that if you had an exponent, a smaller exponent and a bigger exponent, then when you plug them in with this base bigger than one, that expression should be smaller than the other expression. Whereas the opposite happens when the base is a fraction less than one, okay? So if your base is less than one, let's say your base is one half, right? Oh, look, they have an example here. When your base is one half, even though this number is smaller than that number, when you plug them in, you actually get a bigger number for the smaller exponent. Okay, and then you get a bigger, a smaller number for the bigger exponent. I'll leave that there in case anybody's filling in the blanks, but these two we don't really use too much. Essentially what this is gonna do is, is it gonna make the graph look like this? And we'll talk about it in a minute. And then when it's less than one, it kind of flips it over. That's what it does. 
being bigger than one, it looks one way, and being less than one, it flips it over. And it flips it over this way, right? From left to right. Whereas that negative in the front flips it over up and down, right? It flips it over the X axis. So it's a little bit different. We'll get into the graphs, don't worry. <laughs> Maybe not today, but we'll get to it for sure. Okay, so let's do, let me leave that there. So they defined the function, which they already did in that first box, so not much new is happening there. Um, but there's some other things that I needed to mention that I've noticed that I've said them right now, but I noticed that they weren't in the notes before. Um, so I wrote them down, but somehow just in talking about this stuff, I kind of already mentioned it. Um, but these are the three bits of information. So I told you that if the base was greater than one, it looked like that, right? Well, that is constantly increasing, isn't it? And I told you if the base was a fraction less than one, it went the reverse way. Well, now that's constantly decreasing, right? And if you have a negative in front, it's gonna reflect it. So instead of the original, it'll actually go down like this, right? That whole thing is now at the bottom. It flipped over. So it definitely kind of bringing back those um, translation situations, right? No, we still have some time. So these are nice. They're super nice because all these problems you literally just type in your calculator. So when we start to work these out, they gave us one function, two to the power X, and they want me to plug in all of these numbers for X. So for here, it would look like two to the power negative one. For that X value, it would be two to the power three. For this X value, it'd be two to the five halves. And for that X value, it'd be two to the 4.92, okay? And if I type them in my calculator, I could type all of those in my calculator. You just use this little button, this little carrot button for the exponent. Okay, so when I type that in there, I'm gonna type two and then the little carrot and then negative one, and it tells me that it's one half. Two to the third, you could probably do that in your head, but it is eight. These other ones probably you cannot do in your head, right? <laughs> um, so two to the power five over two. So notice that what I have in my calculator looks exactly like what I have on my paper. And when I hit enter, I get this decimal. I think I'm gonna round to four. So 5.656, and this five will turn that eight into a nine. When my lab math asks you to do it, it'll tell you what place to round to, okay? So make sure you pay attention to how many decimal places. Here it didn't tell me, so I just picked. Um, and then two raised to the 4.92, and we get 30.2738, since the four will not change the eight. So those are nice. I mean, if you have those on the test, that's like super awesome, right? Because you're literally just putting it in the calculator. Okay, we'll probably be able to do the graph, but we will not we 
we will not be able to go past that. I don't think, I don't think we'll be able to do the equations part of this. So the next page has this little box, okay? And it tells us some information about the function and there's two different situations going on, okay? There's, oh, there's my notes. Um, there's one situation, right, where I told you the graph was gonna look like this, when your A is greater than one. But then it looks the reverse way when your A is less than one, okay? So I kind of already mentioned that there were gonna be two different images, but here they're just kind of summarizing the details about those images, okay? So they used an example like two to the power X, and they told you if you plug in negative two up there in your calculator, you'll get one fourth. If you plug in negative one up there, you'll get one half like we just did. If you plug in zero up there, anything to the power zero is one. If you plug in one as the exponent, two to the one is just two. If you plug in two as the exponent, two squared is four. And if you plug in three as the exponent, two cubed is three, right? So that's where they're getting all these Y values. And then you would plot those Y values on your graph and you would see that it looks like this, okay? But instead of plotting two over X or two to the power X, they just kept it very general, okay? So this is what your function will look like if your base is bigger than one, okay? And it could be that the base is two. It could be that the base is 1.1. It could be that the base is like five over four, right? All of those numbers are bigger than one. So all of those numbers will have a similar graph. It's just that this point and this point will be different based on that base. Okay. So no matter what, they're going to look like this. It's just this X value will be, or this Y value will be different depending on what your base is. And this Y value will be different depending on what your base is. But they'll all have the same sort of curve shape. So your domain, it does go left forever and right slowly forever. So your domain's negative infinity to infinity. The range though, it has a, a horizontal asymptote. So it never actually like touches the y-axis. So that's why the range is at zero, but it doesn't include the zero because you never ever touch the zero, okay? The y value will never be zero. It'll get really, really close, but never be zero. But it does go up forever, right? So that's why we have positive infinity. So our lowest y value and our highest y value. Lowest x value, highest x value. And then just like they mentioned before, if you have a base bigger than one, it should be increasing on the whole thing. And exponentials are continuous. There's no holes, no breaks, no gaps, nothing like that in an exponential function. And it does have a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. And any, no matter what the base is, okay, no matter what the base is, you will have these three points, negative one, one over A, zero and one, which I put there, and then one and A, which I put here, okay? They will always have these three points, all exponentials. So notice that when you plug in negative one for an exponent, you get the reciprocal, okay? So if my base were two and I plugged in negative one for the exponent, I'd get one over two as the Y value. If you plug in zero for the exponent, it doesn't matter what the base is. Anything raised to the power zero is one. That's why they all share this point. No matter what the base is, they will always have this point. And then finally, if you plug in one as the exponent, I mean, you might as well not even have put an exponent, right? Those are the invisible exponents. So two to the power one would just be still two. So a to the power one, would still just be A. So notice that for negative one, you're gonna get the reciprocal of the base. And for positive one, you're gonna get the base itself. And then that middle, that middle point is always there. Now it's very similar to what's happening in the other graph. 
okay? You have those same exact points. It's just they might look a little different because your base is now a fraction less than one. So notice here the base is one half. Well, what happens when you plug in negative one? You get the reciprocal of one half, which is two over one, right? And two over one can be just rewritten as two. We know that when we plug in zero as the exponent, we'll always get one. And when we plug in one as the exponent, we'll get the base exactly as it was, okay? So it still has those same three points. This is the reciprocal of one half. And this is the base, right? My base was one half. So they'll always have those same points, negative one and the reciprocal of the base, zero, one, and then one and the base itself, which makes them super nice to graph because you have like a template, right? For what the points are gonna be. Similarly, the domain still negative infinity to infinity. It still goes left forever and right forever. The range is still zero to infinity. The Y value never gets to zero but it does go up to positive infinity. But because it's flipped over, when you read it from left to right, it's actually decreasing, right, on the entire domain. But it's still continuous. Me flipping it over doesn't change that there's no holes and no gaps and no breaks. So it's still continuous. And me flipping it over didn't change the, exact, the horizontal asymptote either. So the horizontal asymptote is still at the x axis. And then again, we still have those same three points, which is why it would be the same chart as above. So we're gonna skip the little reflection on the next page, but we'll talk about the graph, okay? So let me give that one a second. I know it's real tiny, but this function here is one over five to the power X. Okay, so for this one, it wants us to graph it and it wants us to give them the domain and the range. I would wait until after you graph it to get the domain and the range, okay? So you essentially create your little table. You're gonna plug in negative one, zero, and one. And you can either just use the calculator to plug them in or you can use the concept that I've mentioned in the table, right? When you plug in negative one, you're gonna get the reciprocal of this base. Well, the reciprocal of one over five is five over one or just five. When you plug in zero as the exponent, you're always gonna get one. And when you plug in one as the exponent, you're always gonna get the exact same base as the result. Oops, light went off. So if I plot these points, let me see. 
They didn't put any marks on here. So I'm going to go up to five, one, two, three, four, five, and negative one and one. So for negative one, we're here at five. For zero, we're here at one. And then for one, we're at one fifth. So like if you were to cut this up into five pieces, one fifth would probably be pretty close to zero, right? And then you just draw the curve. So I like to go from the middle up and then from the middle and trail off. I'm trying. But we know that there's a horizontal asymptote, so it doesn't touch the y-axis, okay, at all. Whenever you do this, you just make your points fatter <laughs> and then nobody will know. <laughs> Okay, now that we have the picture, then we can say what the domain and range is, right? So the domain is going left forever and right forever. So it is negative infinity to infinity. And the range never touches zero, but it gets pretty, pretty close, right? So you do parentheses zero, and it does go up to positive infinity. So we'll do positive infinity there. Now, these will be our last two problems here. So before I start them, let me do that there. There we go. I'm going to actually do some numbers here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. I don't think I need anything other than those, but we'll see, okay? And then I'm gonna do the same thing here. So this one says for us to graph these two functions, but then also show the graph of just plain y equals two to the power x for comparison. So I'm actually gonna use, get the graph of y to the two x first, and then use my transformations, like my reflections and my shifts to come up with the other graph, okay? And then we'll confirm. So, um, for the first one, first let's look at y equals 2x, 2 to the power x. If I create a little chart for it, if I plug in negative 1, it's going to be the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 over 2. If I plug in 0, I'm going to get 1. And if I plug in positive 1, I'm going to get 2, right? You plug those numbers in as your exponents. So I'm going to graph those three points and draw the graph for two to the power x on both of these things, okay? So negative one and one half, zero and one, and then one and two. So we get an image that looks like this and like that. I tried, it's the best I could do. <laughs> now I'll do the other side. Negative one and one half, zero and one, and then one and two. So it has a very similar graph, right? Now, if we think about the translations, remember when you have a negative in front, what does that do? This thing makes the graph reflect over the x axis. So if this point was two or one, two, now it's gonna go downward, right? It's gonna flip over here, down here. Zero, one is gonna flip over and be here. One and one half is gonna flip over and be here. And so then it makes the graph 
have the same kind of behavior, but it's flipped over, right? So this one is f of x. Now in your other graph, you have this plus three. Now it's not a plus three on the side, right? It's a plus three up there with the X. And whenever you had a plus three with the X, whether it was like inside the square, inside the radical, inside the denominator, whatever, that one always made it move left or right, okay? So this exponent, this plus three up there in the exponent is gonna make the graph shift and it's gotta be left or right. And the ones when they're up there is going to be um, the opposite, right? So if it's plus three, you actually go left. Okay. So the plus three makes it shift left three units. If it were minus three, x minus three up there, it'd be going to the right three units. And if it was like this with a regular plus three, not like up tiny, like a little exponent, that would make it move up, right? If it had a minus three, it would make it move down, okay? But if it's up there in the exponent, it goes left or right, and always the opposite of the sign. So let's see what happens when we take all three of these points and we move them over left three units. So instead of here, it's gonna be one, two, three over here. And instead of there, it's going to be one, two, three right here. One, two, three right there. And then I draw the same kind of um, curve. And this one is the function. It does cross this. I just kind of drew it weird. It should go like that, really. There we go. Okay, so it's just using our, our transformations. Now we only have two minutes left and I have one more graph that I wanna do before we start solving equations and getting into compound interest. So uh, which are the word problems? I'm actually going to leave it for the next class so that way we can kind of like come back and, and revisit all of this stuff. Um, so I'm going to leave this one last graph until the next class. Okay. And then we'll start with solving the equations, but it'll help us remember a little chart and then how to work with it that way. Okay. Um, but if there's any additional questions, um, now's the time to ask. If not, you guys are free to go. I'll hang back and see if anybody else has any questions. Um, but that does conclude today's class. So you guys have a good weekend.